Thank you, Christina. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar. I want to give a special thank you to Steve Raven for the invitation to speak here today and to David Spiro for connecting us with Steve. I'd also like to thank Christina for helping us organize and coordinate this presentation. So thank you, Christina. Um, I'm going to be dedicating the next hour breaking down blockchains from a technical perspective. There's a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to keep it as high level as I can and leave time at the end for Q&A to dive deeper into any areas you might find particularly interesting. Before I start, I just want to quickly introduce myself. Um, I first got into the blockchain space in 2017, where I worked as the director of crypto economics in a spoke at Consensus. Consensus is a venture production studio started by the co-founder of Ethereum and is dedicated to building decentralized blockchain infrastructure on the Ethereum network. Over there, I spent my time researching and designing blockchain use cases, alternative business models with digital assets, and protocol architecture for all kinds of companies, ranging from smaller growth stage startups to larger Fortune 500 enterprises. I left Consensus last summer to start a new company, Fractal Group, which I've been growing ever since. Fractal is a blockchain consulting firm that designs, builds, and grows business networks powered by distributed ledger technology. We take a technologically agnostic approach to solving direct business problems for our clients to help them understand if and how blockchain can actually help their bottom line, and then work with them from start to finish to help bring those ideas to reality. Our clients are currently mostly smaller and mid-sized growth stage companies, although we have recently been speaking to larger enterprises as well. So we know the firsthand challenges and obstacles that arise when pursuing a blockchain strategy. All right, with that in mind, let's start diving into the content. The goal of today is to leave you all with a much better understanding of the mechanisms that actually make blockchains work. To do that, I'm first gonna give a brief overview about how distributed systems work today. Then I'm gonna highlight specific challenges and differences that blockchain technology introduces to the traditional distributed systems framework. Finally, I'm gonna talk about the trade-offs between various implementations and their significance. By the end of this presentation, I hope that you'll have a better idea for how and when blockchains should be used and designed so that you can feel more comfortable leveraging the technology as one more tool at your disposal for solving your business needs. With that in mind, let's begin. What is a blockchain? A, a blockchain is technically a data structure, but it's colloquially referred to as a new type of distributed system. So I think it's important before I dive straight into blockchains to talk a little bit about distributed systems first. A distributed system is most simply explained as a network of computers that essentially work together to operate as a single computer to an end user. It does so by maintaining a shared state across the computers, which I'm gonna to refer to from here on out as nodes, through constant coordination by passing messages back and forth. Distributed systems have a few characteristics that are important to understand. The first is concurrency. This means that multiple events can occur simultaneously and be executed independently by different nodes in the network. The second is messaging. Nodes need to be constantly passing messages about changes they think should be made to the network to coordinate on the information that they agree on. The third is distributed systems also need fault tolerance. Because network behavior can be unpredictable, nodes can crash for any arbitrary reason and networks must be designed to account for this when it happens. Another characteristic is also a lack of a single global clock in distributed systems. This is because each node will still need to maintain a local clock, and these clocks can slowly drift apart over time, even if they are initially synced. Additionally, information that travels through a network experiences latency and is not always reliably delivered, making it difficult to reason about the global uh, time ordering of events across all the nodes in the network. Because of this, using timestamps within a network is unreliable and a better way of establishing the order of events is needed. Finally, there's synchronicity. This refers to the expectation of how messages are delivered. So generally, there are two ways to describe a distributed systems, synchronous and asynchronous. In a synchronous system, you can assume that messages will be delivered within a fixed and known amount of time. Synchronous systems aren't very practical to design around because the network behavior can often be unpredictable and unreliable. In an asynchronous system, it's assumed that a network might delay messages or deliver them out of order. In other words, there's no fixed upper bound on how long a message might take to be received. 
Amidst all the chaos, distributed systems need some way to maintain order so that they can coordinate on how to handle any changes made to the state of the system. The easiest way to do this is with something called a replicated state machine. A replicated state machine is composed of three parts. The first part is to define an initial state across all the nodes and the valid transactions or changes to the state that can be made in the network. The second is for the nodes to communicate and distribute the transactions that are being made across the network so that every node has a copy. Third, every node keeps a log of all the historical transactions that were ever made. By doing so, as long as the log of transaction history can be maintained, every node can replay the transactions from the initial state to the state at any historical point. This allows nodes to apply transactions asynchronously while remaining consistent in behavior, which resolves a lot of the previously mentioned issues. In my research, I've also found immutable transaction logs as a design pattern to be used in many distributed systems to coordinate behavior. For example, log-structured file systems and log-structured merge trees are used in creating reliable and performant distributed file systems. Google File System uses this, and uh, same with SSDs. This is actually how they manage their flash chips internally. A similar design pattern exists in something that everyone should probably be pretty familiar with, code version control, where modifications to code are applied as sequential changes or commits on top of a database, uh, sorry, code base, helping with the management and coordination of distributed software development. It's not that difficult to architect nodes to use logs to store transaction history. The hard part comes from getting all the nodes in the network to agree on using the same transaction log. This process of creating and establishing which transaction log to use is called consensus. Consensus is made up of two parts, safety and liveness. Safety just means that all nodes have to arrive at the same values so that one node isn't showing one thing while another is showing something completely different. Liveness means that all the nodes have to be able to keep making changes to the network. Consensus is made up of three parts. Uh, first part is leader election, or the process for a node to become a proposer. Proposers are nodes that can introduce new transactions to the rest of the network. The second is validation, which describes the process for other nodes to express agreement with the proposed changes of the first node. The third is finalization, which is the threshold of votes that are needed by the network to consider a transaction transaction truly final. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, consensus is really difficult to achieve. Um, in 1985, there was a paper published by three researchers called The Impossibility of Distributed Consensus with One Faulty Process. This paper concluded that in an asynchronous setting where messages may be delayed indefinitely, there's no consensus mechanism that exists in a setting where one node might crash. This is because in asynchronous networks, there's no limit to the amount of time a node might take to vote. So it's impossible to determine whether or not a voting node has crashed or simply taking too long to respond. As a result, consensus freezes up waiting for a response before the transaction becomes finalized and the system uh, can move on. Most of you guys are probably familiar with or have at least used technologies that include consensus models. Paxos and Raft are two popular implementations. Paxos is used in Apache Zookeeper, which makes appearances in Cassandra, Hadoop, and Kafka, for example. And Raft is used in ETCD, which helps coordinate container management in Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. So how do they manage consensus? These existing consensus models circumvent the FLP limitations with something called assumed synchrony. This just means that they use timeouts. So if consensus hangs on getting to the next value for whatever reason, the system waits until the next timeout and then starts the steps all over again. Uh, this GIF represents RAF consensus in action. In the GIF, the gray ring around each node represents a randomly generated timeout value. At timeout, the S1 node will start a leader selection process so it can become the propo proposer of the next transaction. After receiving majority votes, the proposer broadcasts a transaction that everyone else accepts, and each node's state transitions together. Usually, this all works nice and smoothly. But in certain circumstances, two nodes may time out at the exact same time. Unfortunately, this is where the GIF cuts off, but imagine a situation where the S5 and S3 nodes time out at the exact same time, and the S1 node crashed for whatever reason. 
the S4 and S2 nodes vote and split their votes, resulting in no node becoming a proposer. Uh, when this happens, the network simply waits for the next node, which looks like to be S4, to time out, who will reestablish a new vote and propose a transaction. After that, everything will continue running as normal. So that's pretty much distributed systems in a nutshell. Now, how does blockchain play in? Well, blockchains are distributed systems that are shared between multiple parties and openly accessible. Until this point, we've only really talked about distributed systems as if a single entity is responsible for all the nodes in the network. Because of this, we can trust that the nodes will behave honestly. But blockchain systems introduce this new paradigm. With multiple parties involved, you might have conflicting incentives between the nodes. Various parties in the network might be adversarial. And despite these complexities, there still needs to be a way that allows people to join in and leave at any point. As a result, blockchains need to include three new characteristics that weren't necessary in traditional distributed systems. The first is transaction identification. Because you have multiple parties in a network, it's important for transactions to be differentiated between the various participants. Nodes now have to identify who and where transactions originate to preserve their integrity as they are broadcasted across the blockchain network. The second is dynamic transaction ordering. When building the shared transaction logs, between nodes and distributed blockchain systems. The replicated state machine now has to account for multiple parties in the network that each have their own agenda about which transactions the network should include. To resolve this, blockchains have to make significant changes to the architecture of a normal replicated state machine. Blockchains also need new properties in consensus. Like I mentioned before, in centralized distributed systems, nodes are expected to be honest because they're controlled by a single entity. This means that a majority of nodes is enough to reach consensus. But when you have multiple parties, each with their own incentives, the network can become adversarial, and nodes can lie or spread false messages to each other, which the new consensus mechanism has to account for. The first point I'm going to address is how blockchains create transaction identification and integrity. Blockchains use cryptographic signatures, so transactions are immutable and unforgeable. More specifically, they use a type of cryptography called asymmetric cryptography or public key cryptography. This type of cryptography enables the creation of a public and private key pair that can be used in a specific way to identify users while remaining unforgeable. Blockchains use a subset of asymmetric cryptography called elliptic curve cryptography. This just means that the pu public and private key pairs are generated through the relationship of points along an elliptic curve. Um, fun fact, most blockchains use the same elliptic curve called SECP256K1 to generate their public and private key pairs. The name just refers to the set of constants that are used to generate this specific elliptic curve. ECDSA, or elliptic curve digital signature algorithms, are used in blockchain technology for three reasons. First, their computational performance is economical compared to a lot of other algorithms. Second, the keys that are generated are relatively short. And third, Bitcoin started it, so all the other blockchain projects just copied it. Cryptography is its own beast, so I'm not going to get too much into the weeds here. But just as a review, the unique public and private key pair that's generated enables two key functions to help with message identification. The first function is called sign which takes a transaction and a private key as parameters. It outputs a unique digital signature for the given transaction. This signature can be checked by the verify function, which takes a transaction, a public key, and a signature output as parameters to return a Boolean based on if the signature is authentic. As a result, with asymmetric encryption, anyone can participate in the network and propose state transactions. This enables blockchains to have the flexibility of including third parties without needing to know about them ahead of time, which establishes the basis for openly and accessible distributed systems. One last detail about ECDSA signatures, specifically in the context of blockchain transactions, is that instead of one, you actually have three components of the output. You have a V and R and an S. The R and S components are part of the normal output of an ECDSA signature. Because elliptic curves are symmetrical, they have multiple candidate points when verifying the signature output. 
the V component in the blockchain transactions are used to verify which of the candidate points is actually used for a specific signature. But the V output isn't actually necessary for the verification, it just makes it faster. Next, I'm gonna talk about the architecture of the new replicated state machine. It's a blockchain. So when thinking about dynamic transaction ordering, the new replicated state machine is necessary to preserve the integrity of the transaction history while accounting for multiple parties. And this is where the blockchain derives its name. The transaction logs of nodes are arranged into these sets of transactions called blocks, which are proposed, distributed, and validated by the network. The specifics of what's in a block is unique to the implementation of the blockchain, but in general, it's composed of three parts. The first is a digital footprint of all the transactions in order in the block called a Merkle root. The Merkle root is part of a larger structure called a Merkle tree, which is the data structure used by blockchains to store all the transaction information within a block. The second component of a block is the vote weight. The implementation of this changes based on the consensus mechanism of the blockchain, but vote weight is the general uh, validity metric used to determine the finality or legitimacy of a block. I'm gonna talk more about this later. The last piece is a reference to the previous block. When a block's components are hashed, the hash is referred to as the block header. It's an immutable representation of all the block's contents. In a block, the reference to the previous block is just the previous block's header, which is a footprint of its Merkle root, vote weight, and reference to the block before it. Because hashes are deterministic, if anything changes about previous information, uh, in a historical block, all the subsequent block headers of the blockchain will change as a result. Merkle roots preserve the integrity of the transaction order within a block, and block header hashes are used to preserve the integrity of the block order throughout its history. Together, they create an immutable order of events that each node can safely depend on to determine the network state from the very beginning. When consensus is formed on a block, consensus is implied on the entire chain of blocks before it. This is how we create what we now know as a decentralized blockchain network and how it can have all the immutability and security properties that we hear about. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit more about where Merkle root comes from. When one party runs on the nodes, they can trust each other by default because they know how the messages are delivered. Uh, when there's multiple parties involved, you can't trust incoming messages from nodes because you don't know where they originate. As a result, blockchains require nodes to validate every set of proposed transactions. This makes them a lot slower and a lot more expensive than centralized distributed systems. The significant cost increase comes from the replicated validation process. Merkle trees are used to try to make this process as simple and as effective as possible. To understand how Merkle trees are constructed, let's take a look at the diagram. We can see that there are eight transactions in our Merkle tree, transactions A through H. To construct this tree, every transaction is hashed. The combination of these hashes are then hashed again, and you repeat this until you arrive at a single hash that represents the combination of all transactions in the tree. This single hash is called the Merkle root, and this is what is included in the block. Merkle roots are, or Merkle trees, I'm sorry, are used in blockchain because they preserve the integrity of transaction orders with efficient runtime for proofs relative to any other potential structure. For example, let's say we want to check if transaction D is included in this specific Merkle tree, and we only have the reference to the root in our block. To construct the proof, we only need the hash of C, the hash of A and B, and the hash of E, F, G, and H. We can quickly reconstruct the Merkle root by recombining and hashing these together until we arrive at the hash of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H to confirm that indeed the transaction exists in the Merkle tree. If any transaction is missing or changed, the root will not match, but we can see that something is wrong. There are other data structures that can be used to achieve the same properties as a Merkle tree, like a hash chain. A hash chain is just a chain of all the transaction hashes that are hashed together one by one. But in order to check the validity of a, of a given transaction, 
Hash chains require you to get the hashes of every transaction to reconstruct the hash chain one by one. This takes linear runtime instead of the logarithmic runtime provided by the Merkle tree. Of all the data structures, Merkle proofs require the least memory and disk space, as well as the least information that needs to be transmitted across the network, which saves bandwidth. Finally, I'm going to talk about how differences in consensus affect network properties. How consensus algorithms, uh, algorithms facilitate vote weighting uh, mechanisms will have a huge implication on the underlying properties of the network. As a reminder, vote weight is used as an expression of agreement amongst the nodes. When considering consensus, the finalization of transactions or blocks of transactions must be determined through a threshold of votes in the system. In proof of work, vote weight represents the amount of computing power spent to arrive at a given block. Vote weight here is measured in difficulty. Difficulty can be a little hard to understand, so let me try to explain. When blocks are hashed, they generate a block header. Block headers, as numerical values, are pseudo-randomly determined because the normalized distribution of a hashing function. Difficulty here represents a number that the new block headers have to be below. The higher the difficulty, the lower the number is, because there is a lower chance of randomly generating a block header below that number. To manipulate block header outputs, a parameter is included in the block called a nonce. The nonce value has nothing to do with the rest of the contents in the block. When a block with the right nonce hashes into the block header below a given difficulty, the block is considered valid. As a result, nodes constantly generate hashes of blocks with new nonces until they find one. And this is the metric of work or validity in the proof of work blockchain. In proof of work, there's no definite finality to the blocks that are being produced because the amount of possible votes in the system is infinite. Nodes can always increase their computing power and attempt more hashes with new nonces. Proof of work blockchains consider the block with the highest difficulty to be the most valid because it's assumed that the majority of nodes are contributing work to that block. Additionally, proof of work chains are enforced through an economic incentive called a block reward. Blocks produced on the same chain reward those who discover them, meaning that honest third parties will by default coordinate to work on the same chain. However, it's theoretically possible to create an alternative chain with higher difficulty and not publish it to the rest of the network. This would, in theory, invalidate all of the transactions on the main chain, but would require the alternative chain to have more cum cumulative computing power and, by implication, resources on it than the original chain. As a result, the probability of uh, creating an alternative chain decreases and the cost of doing so increases as the network continues to grow and more participants join. In the context of the FLP theorem, Proof of work sacrifices safety in order to maintain liveness and fault tolerance. On the other hand, vote weight in a consensus mechanism called proof of stake is represented through an ownership of tokens. Total votes are measured through signature aggregation. Various token owners must cryptographically sign their approval on blocks which they consider to be legitimate, which are aggregated in the block header. When the block header contains enough votes to cross a certain threshold, the block is considered finalized and therefore valid. Safety in this context is absolutely determined because there is no upper bound, or because there is an upper bound to the possible voting threshold. However, given the context of the FLP theorem, this means that proof of stake based blockchains compromise on liveness. Because the chain cannot finalize changes, the blockchain will stop producing new blocks if not enough votes are collected. Similar to proof of work, proof of stake blockchains try to prevent this, uh, or they should at least, by implementing what's called slashing conditions, which are a set of economic punishments for not participating in the consensus process. Examples of slashing conditions can be docking tokens uh, from a node for missing a vote on a block or going down for too long and not responding to messages. Proof-of-work and proof-of-stake blockchains are built around the principles of economic consensus, 
consensus enforced not through the node itself, but on the economic contribution that the node represents. There are other Byzantine fault tolerant consensus mechanisms that aren't this way. The most popular variants are defined under a subset of consensus called proof of authority. In proof of authority, nodes are pre-identified before joining a network and a general one node, one vote rule is how vote weight is distributed. In proof of authority consensus, safety is still guaranteed because finality is still absolutely determined. According to FLP limitations, this means that liveness is what's being compromised to preserve fault tolerance. Unlike economically incentivized blockchains, proof of authority networks generally encourage participation with reputation. Because the identities of the nodes are established ahead of time, failure to participate or malicious behavior can be attributed to specific people. Also, this consensus strategy is usually used between parties that already have aligned uh, economic interest, like a consortium or a set of businesses within an industry that want to maintain a shared distributed system. So the concerns around implementing proof of authority are a little bit different. <clears throat> so what does this all mean when thinking about implementing a blockchain? Just like consensus in centralized distributed systems, there is no one size fits all mechanism that will solve every problem. Who the nodes are in the network and what they are uh, and, uh, is gonna be a huge factor in determining the right consensus algorithm. I'm gonna leave that part up for you guys to decide. But before I go, there are just a few more uh, details about consensus and blockchain implementation that I think should be considered. The first is block production rate. Blockchains like Raft or Paxos often use timeouts to determine how fast blocks can be produced. The faster the block production, the more data can be pushed through the network. This is usually what you hear about when people talk about transactions per second or scalability. High block production rates might increase scalability, but depending on how your network looks, it might introduce other complexities as well. Larger networks need slower block times because the time it takes to propagate blocks across the network is larger. So think about how much slower information is going to take to arrive at a network uh, in a network of 10,000 nodes versus a network of 10 nodes. This means that with faster block production, you increase the likelihood of block collisions, where two blocks might be produced on opposite ends of the network that conflict in logic, so that only one of them is valid. The network is going to have to spend significant resources determining which block to use. In proof of work especially, this can be very expensive as the computation spent on generating a valid block will be wasted. The second consideration is how block proposers are selected. For this example, I'm going to use two proof of stake blockchain implementations that you see at the bottom of the slide. In Tendermint, block producers are deterministically selected. A counter is uh, incremented round robin style so the rest of the network can see who's up in line to produce blocks. From an implementation standpoint, this can be a lot more straightforward. But from a security standpoint, you run into censorship resistance issues since it becomes a lot more easy to DDoS the network. You only have to DDoS the next in line block producer to silence the whole network. On the other hand, in Substrate, block producers are non-deterministically selected through co collective coin flipping, which makes it hard to predict who the next node to propose a block will be. This is great for security, but it means that nodes in the network don't have latency guarantees to the rights that they're allowed to make, which might affect usability. So with that in mind, what are some of the current tools out there that you can start playing with? Blockchain technology is still really young, and despite the amount of money that's gone into it, there's not a lot of existing infrastructure that you can use to get started. If you want to get started with proof of work, I would take a look at Geth and Parity implementations. Uh, they're both Ethereum clients. Geth is written in Golang, uh, and Parity is written in Rust. Um, if you think about, uh, if you want to think about proof of stake, I would take a look at Tendermint and Substrate. Tendermint is the main client and consensus model that's used in the Cosmos network. Um, Substrate is the main client that's used in the Polkadot network, and each of these come with different properties that I discussed before. If you want to get more into it. Um, you can ask you know, questions at the end of this presentation. For proof of authority, um, 
you can experiment with Quorum. Quorum is a JP Morgan fork of Geth uh, with a few extra privacy features enabled. You can also look at service platforms like Kaleido, uh, which is part of Consensus. And it's basically a platform to launch Quorum nodes or Geth nodes with any kind of consensus configuration that you want. Um, that's all I have for today. There's a lot of uh, important information that we didn't cover on this talk, like the various monetization strategies or business opportunities that we've identified through our experiences working with companies similar to yours. The rest of this time will be dedicated to a Q&A where I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have uh, that are related to the technology or its business applications. So with that in mind, the floor is yours.